Hey guys, and welcome to or back to the Pause in Pursuit podcast with your host, Summer Clark. So, first of all, before we begin, um, happy Crufts Week. Um, I'm recording this on Tuesday the 7th of March. So that means um, I'll be competing at Crufts in two days' time, which is absolutely insane. When you're listening to this, Crufts is literally tomorrow. Um, so just a quick reminder um, to come say hi if you see me at Crufts, because I've had people say, oh, I'm too scared to come up to you at shows, blah, blah, blah don't be come up to me say hi it'll be fun uh, i'll be there i'm going to be um vlogging for youtube so you'll probably see me doing that as well but yeah super exciting cross week um but anyway today um i had i got this idea for today's podcast episode off a fitness podcast that i was listening to this morning and it is 15 things i stopped doing to up my agility game so you know it's easy to talk about the things we should be doing um you know here are my top tips for doing this blah 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 but what about the things that we have actually stopped doing the habits um that weren't serving us a purpose uh, that we managed to stop doing and you know break those habits and you know by not doing something that we used to do uh, we get better basically so these are the things that i'm going to share with you today so let's get straight into it so number one um and probably the most obvious one that most of you guys probably also do um, and everyone does it, is I stopped comparing myself to others. Um, again, this still happens sometimes, but a lot less than it did. This is a habit that definitely needs breaking. So I stopped comparing my results in competition to others, uh, my performance, um, you know, so not just just what I thought my runs were like compared to other people's uh, progress, so how fast I was progressing with my dogs uh, and with training, uh, my handling. So I stopped comparing my handling style to others um, and training frequency. I stopped looking at other people and thinking they're training so much more than me. I'm not doing enough. I'm slacking. No wonder I'm not where they are, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, that is a huge one. Um, I, I don't think I really need to elaborate on that one. You know, you just got to remember that everyone's journey is different. Uh, there's no point comparing yourself and your dog to anyone else because even like training frequency, um, I don't have a space to train that's mine. A lot of people do have a field with a full set of equipment. They could train a lot more than me for that reason and more intensely, um, which may show in their results at shows compared to me and stuff like that. That's just how it is, so there's no point comparing. Um, results, you know, we all have brilliant runs. We all have terrible runs. It's just how it is. You know, one day I might have all good runs and someone else have all bad runs, but then the next they have some good runs and I have bad runs and vice versa. Um, handling, you know, you, you just need to find a handling, you know, you need to find a style that works for you, handle in a way that you're comfortable and that your dog understands. And there's absolutely no point comparing as long as it works for you, who cares? Um, progress, yeah, again, a bit like having your own space to train. Everyone um, improves at different rates because of what is available to them and also what that, you know, the character of their dog. I have a nervous dog in Arrow, so he's taking longer. Whereas if you get a confident dog like Ethel straight away, Ethel progress really fast same handler, you know, so there's no point comparing, um, don't compare dogs, um, and yeah, performance wise, you know, everyone has those runs, um, we're all going through the exact same thing, no one's better or worse or what, everyone's just different, so don't compare yourself to others, that's something I used to do that I stopped, and it is up to my game in agility, because it allows me to just purely focus on myself and my dog, so number two is letting others influence how I handle a course, so Again, this is very easy to do, especially if you say you've just graded up and you're suddenly now in, for example, four to five courses instead of one to three or six or seven instead of four to five. Um, you know, we can be a bit unsure. We feel like we've gone from being a big fish in a small pond to a small fish in a big pond all of a sudden. And we may look to others that have maybe been competing on those courses for longer. Um, so watching others during course walking, you know, have you ever just been like unsure of how to handle a section? So you step back and watch everyone else do it. That's fine. That is fair enough. Um, like I said, take advice and inspiration and learn from others. But it is important to listen to yourself first. So you need to be able to make your own decisions on stuff like this, just like you would um, at training if you're on your own tackling that course. Um, you know, and not just watching people on course, but letting other people tell you how to handle a course. So standing on course and having someone else say, oh, yes, handle it like this, because unless it's your trainer um, who also knows you and your dog, um, the chances of you listening to a random other person with a completely different dog and it going perfectly for you as well as them is unlikely. You know, do it how you want to um, to do it and how you think your dog will respond best. Um, like I said, only you know your dog best and maybe your trainer. Like I said, Lucy has a very good idea of, of me and Arrow and what will suit us, so I would always take her advice on how to handle, but 
you know, as far as just other competitors, random people giving you giving you advice, take it on board, but don't let that decide it. You know, go with yourself first. Trust your gut, your instinct, how you think you should handle the course first. Um, so, yeah, I stopped letting others influence how I handled the course and started focusing on, you know, how I knew Arrow would respond best. Um, same with Ethel. Um, and every dog's different. I even handle Ethel and Arrow different, and I'm the same handler. <laughs> so just you know your dog. Go for what you and your dog will do best together as a partnership, and you can't go wrong. And the more experience you have um, running your dog, the more you'll get to know um, know your dog and what works for both of you. So just give it time, and you will learn those things naturally along the way. So three, again, changing my mind about how to handle a course last minute. The amount of times I've done this and regretted it immediately and thinking, Summer, why didn't you just trust your decision because you would have been right? Um, so, for example, you're, you're queuing for a court, for a run, and you're watching the course, and you're watching people in front of you um, run the course, and they do it a different way, and it works, and you're like, ooh, that looks really good, that looks better than the way I walked it. So then you go in, do it, you haven't walked it like that, so it goes wrong, doesn't it, because you don't know where you're meant to be, you know, everything feels different um, when you're actually on the course to just watching it from the sidelines. So if you haven't walked it that way, then you're unlikely to handle it as well as the way you have walked it, because that's the point of walking it, isn't it? You get a feel, you not just know where you're going, but you get a feel for how you're going to handle it. Um, that's why we walk horses in the, in the way that we do. We pretend we have the dog there. So when we actually are there, we've already done it once. But if you watch someone else handle it a different way that you haven't even tried on the course during walking, then that's like, it's as if you haven't walked the course. And the chances of doing a run perfectly are slim when you don't walk the course, especially if it's a hard course. I know it can be done. I've done it before. Um, you know, when, you, when you're when you late or whatever reason, something, something unexpected happens. But where you can just handle it how you walked it trust yourself um again that kind of ties into two you know your dog um and you walked it a certain way for a reason you chose that handling option for a reason so trust your decision don't doubt yourself again this will come more with experience but that is something that upped my game uh four rushing the journey i stopped rushing the journey with arrow a long time ago but there was a point where i was trying to rush the journey um again it's just natural to want to rush um and you know get success faster i think that's just human instinct especially for people like me who are quite competitive um but you know i was putting my pressure on myself to achieve my goals faster so i had my goals and there's nothing wrong with goal setting in fact i think you should goal set um but give yourself realistic time frames for a start and you know just go at your own pace um everyone's journey is different every dog is different like i said before go at your own pace and it will pay off so arrow is three and a half um he's actually more behind as far as progressing and for those of you not watching youtube i just did a little finger air quotation marks um when i said behind because i don't think there's such thing as behind really um but you know it you can feel end up feeling like that naturally you just got to remind yourself that you know snap out of it there isn't such thing i'm doing fine i'm doing the best i can um but yeah arrow i thought arrow was behind compared to how say where ethel was at that age you know but ethel had full confidence arrow didn't so of course they're going to be different uh, but I'm in a great place with Arrow now. Um, I think taking it slow um, and not rushing the journey has paid off wonders. You know, he's I couldn't be asking for more of him with his performance at the moment. Um, so, yeah, I stopped rushing the journey. And, you know, it's not just helped my agility performance, but it's also made agility more enjoyable for me. Um, and, yeah, it's just taken the, taken the stress off, you know, brought the fun back. So that is a huge one. So number five, see this is an interesting one because again it's very personal but for me I stopped training every day so there was a point uh, where I was training every day and again I wasn't over training, it was literally five minutes every day and that works for a lot of people and I do and it did work at the time, um, you know when you have a specific thing you want to work on so for example for me it was the seesaw, maybe put arrow over like four seesaws every day um, and then the weather was, I think the weather was quite bad for a while and I didn't do it for a while in the garden and his seesaws in competitions got better like recently um and i haven't been training every day and i think with a dog like arrow who overthinks the more he has to think about it every day the more he overthinks it when he sees it again in competition whereas he hasn't if he hasn't seen it for a while you know at the end of the day he knows his job he knows what to do on a seesaw he's done it plenty of times you know i can't teach him anything new on that now that's just you know it is what it is i was just repeating it hoping to drill it in his head um, but I think I'd done that enough that it was in his head um, and then he didn't see it for a while um, 
I maybe saw it like once a week at our uh, training classes, our group training classes with Lucy on a Wednesday, and that was it. And then he'd go at the weekend, and he wasn't overthinking it. He just did it. And I don't know the signs behind that, but that is what I found. Um, so, you know, training every day might work for some people, and it did work for me at a point, but it also made agility feel more like a chore for me, like I had to fit it in every single day. Um, so now I just train a few times a week, and to be honest, I do feel more refreshed um, when it when it comes to the weekend and I'm at a show. I don't feel, oh, this again, you know. Um, again, this ties into what I'm going to come on to about, you know, agility being everything for you. Um, but, yeah, tra I stopped training every day, and it has actually helped... Um, both mentally for me and clearly for Arrow because, you know, I think he's improved lately. Uh, okay, so six, training when I didn't want to. I stopped training when I didn't want to and now if I don't want to train, I just don't train. Uh, different with my group sessions with Lucy. Sometimes I get up and it's horrible weather and cold and I don't want to leave the house to do that <laughs> for two hours, but I do it anyway because, one, I paid for it, two, why would I not want to go? Why would I not go to training with such an amazing trainer? Um, but yeah, as far as like your own little bits of training go, if you don't want to, if you don't want to go out and do it one day, don't just don't just do it the next day. Um, you know, so if I was tired, if I was upset for whatever reason, if I was feeling irritated, or if I was a bit ill, like if I got a bit of a cold, a sore throat, you know, if I just wasn't feeling up to it. Um, I still just made myself go out and do it. Um, and it never really went that well when I did that. Um, you know, our dogs pick up on our states of mind. Um, they're not going to perform as well when we're in a bad state of mind like that. Um, and you can't connect with your dog in that headspace, to be honest. Or you could try, but it's very hard and it's not really enjoyable for either of you. Uh, so I found that it's more productive to actually skip that session for that day and just do it the next day when you're feeling better. You know, and sometimes you are going to be ill or whatever and you're going to have to have a week off training. It's not the end of the world. Um, but yeah, I stopped training when I didn't want to train. Um, and even if you do have your group class booked in, but you wake up like full of cold and really ill and shivery and you just don't feel like it, you know, you're really groggy, your eyes are closing and stuff like that. You can, you know, you can just give it a miss that week if you really, you know, if you really don't feel up to it, that's totally fine. Um, and then seven is, mm, see, this is, this is kind of changing subjects quite rapidly, but training one, uh, sorry, I've just done that one. <laughs> Going straight into a run without warming up. So now we're going on sort of the handle of fitness side of it. Um, you will never run at your best with cold muscles, let's be honest. Um, you know the feeling when you've been sat around doing nothing and then you get up. You can't just go for a run straight away. You will probably hurt yourself for a start. You'll pull a muscle, tear something. Who knows? Um, yeah, you're likely to injure yourself. And even if you don't injure yourself, you'll never run at your best. Um... You know, you need, to, you need to warm up to get that flexibility and mobility in your joints and your muscles and your tendons and your ligaments. You know, if they're all warmed up and ready to go, you'll be able to run faster. You'll be able to change direction faster. Uh, you're less likely to fall over if you're someone who, has, you know, falls over for whatever reason on course. Um, I have done that before, so no hate. Um, but yeah, I stopped going into a run without warming up and I started really focusing on giving myself that five minutes. And that's all it takes you know, before every run to really warm myself up, get myself ready. Um, not only does it help physically with my muscles and stuff, but it also helps me mentally to get in the zone. So that's a double whammy there. That's two benefits in one. Um, and then the other end of that spectrum, uh, number eight, I stopped sitting straight back down after a run without cooling down. So I, you know, 30 second sprint and then I just go back to the van and sit there. Um, no, not not a good idea. Uh, your muscles are likely to be stiff and sore during your next run if you do that. So not only are you likely to get injured, but if you don't, you know, so lactic acid builds up in your muscles when you exercise. And if you just stop, then it just sits there and builds up and then your muscles will be stiff and sore. I'm pretty sure that's how it works. Don't quote me on that. But it's something along those lines. Um, it's not a nice feeling at the end of the day. Uh, let's be honest. So if you do some stretches to cool down um, afterwards, then that'll return your muscles to the state that they should be in to rest and then when you go to warm up and run again a few hours later uh, if you're at a competition where you have like four runs then um you know they'll be they'll be ready and primed for that so that is huge so they go hand in hand warming up and cooling down your warm-up should be sort of um you shouldn't stretch cold muscles so stretching is the cool down for me uh, i stretch to cool down but for warm-ups you know Jogging the spot, leg swings, um, opening the gates, closing the gates, if you know what I mean. Um, stuff like that, you know, kind of functional warming up. So nine is not doing any other form of fitness besides agility outside of agility. So um, 
I now incorporate fitness training into my daily routine, as I've said in previous podcast episodes, and that has been absolutely huge for my agility performance. Um, you know, I've got faster, I've got more mobile, excuse me, agile, all sorts. Um, I've really noticed I can easily beat Arrow down a running dog walk now and even get a blind in afterwards. Um, just stuff like that, I've really thought, oh, okay, like I can actually really trust myself to make it, um, especially when you've got a fast dog um, on you know, European courses especially where you have to absolutely peg it um, and shout the whole way round and stuff like that. Uh, that is a huge one. So I stopped not doing any other form of fitness and started, um, you know, I started weightlifting, running, swimming and stretching on the daily pretty much. Obviously, I've still got one or two days a week where I don't, um, but I do train six days a week um, and then have one day where I don't do any other fitness training just for that rest and recovery so I can sort of, you know, build muscle, just recover so I don't hurt myself but yeah so I stopped not doing any other form of fitness because there was a point where I just did agility and I didn't do anything else <laughs> but I don't recommend that so there you go um and then 10 oh also before we move on um it's just it's good to know uh what you know what types of fitness you should be doing for agility so um if you haven't already watched it go back a few episodes ago and listen to my um podcast with Chris Curtin and we talk all things handle fitness you know what kinds of fitness um is beneficial for agility but just to give you an idea yeah I do uh, four days weightlifting in the gym a week one day running where I do a 5k run one day swimming I'll swim 800 meters and I stretch after all of those um, and then I have one day off but often my day off is competing <laughs> to be honest I should probably take more rest but anyway that's besides the point so that's that and 10 following the crowd see this is a funny one and you will laugh at me but you also might relate. So following the crowd instead of doing things purely for my own benefit. I stopped. I stopped following the crowd a long time ago because there's not. it doesn't do anything for you. Um, so a, a funny example is Solomons. So as you probably know, Solomons are the in shoe. They are the brand that everyone who does agility really owns. Um, and they have a good rep. You know, they've got nice grip. You're not going to deck out in them, blah, blah, blah. Uh, they're bigged up everywhere. So I obviously bought some. Um thought yep yeah, okay cool lamp fall over whatever it's fine uh i think I, i've had like three four pairs now but one day i was like you know what i'm not comfortable i was getting shin splints all of a sudden um i think as i started running arrow i got shin splints in them um as i was running faster and stuff um and they just felt really hard and uncomfortable on my feet again i didn't really have to run as fast with ethel so it wasn't as much of an issue but i just found i couldn't like properly extend myself in them like i I just felt like I had bricks on my feet really again this isn't slating the brand it's just me personally they gave me shin splints um and I have very long narrow feet um so I had to do them really tight as well and because they're sort of a hard solid shoe which is great for a lot of people but for me that just didn't suit my type of foot um and you know because I have kind of long feet um it's quite hard on the the tip of the toe is quite hard on that shoe so that that was a bit uncomfortable um so that was a trendy brand that I, I followed the crowd and just thought, oh, I'll get some, you know, it'd be good. Uh, but I found it uncomfortable, so I changed to a different brand of shoe. And now I just have a, I have Asics trainers now. Um, and they're much softer and they just fit my um, shape and size and not size, shape of foot. Um, the sizes in every shoe, I don't know why I said that. Uh, but yeah, they suit me a lot more. They're softer on my feet. I feel like I can sort of just run more comfortably really um it doesn't feel like i have anything on my foot like it does when i wear solomon's so you just need to do what works for you basically and not follow the trends or the what's in or what everyone else is saying you should do you know again take it into consideration but don't base all of your decisions on what other people are doing um i know it can be quite hard especially in agility with it being a very community-based sport you know and even on facebook and everything everyone's talking to everyone about everything so it's easy to get influenced by other people but yeah I stopped following the crowd, um, now I just do everything, you know, for my own benefit that I think will best suit me, and that is a big one, that's the same in, in life in general really, isn't it, D not just agility I suppose, um, but number 11 is I stopped having a short term mindset, so again it's very easy to get carried away and have a short term mindset and want all your success, success, success right now, um, you know, so I used to think of every run as the be all and end all, um, I would let every single run bother me and it still does to some extent as you know I am not a naturally great loser and I'm very competitive I'll admit I'm getting better I'm a lot better than I used to be um, I'm pretty fine now I can oh sorry I've oh 
I don't know what just happened. Anyway, <laughs> something happened with my throat there. Um, but yeah, so um, I got frustrated at myself for not achieving my goals um, in the unrealistic time frames that I gave myself. So I started off by, again, back to earlier's point with goal setting, I started off by giving myself unrealistic time frame for goals because I was impatient and I want the success as soon as possible, as everyone naturally does. Um, but then when I inevitably didn't achieve those goals in those unrealistic time frames, I got frustrated with myself because I was like, why didn't I do that? Even though it's obvious, because it was unrealistic and I need to give myself an arrow more time. Um, and Ethel when she was competing. Um, so, yeah, I, I stopped having that short-term mindset and kind of thought of all my goals as, you know, something to work towards but not to rush. Again, back to the rushing. So you just need to be patient, be realistic and give yourself time and enjoy the process. You know, the fun is in the process. You know, once you achieve a goal, you don't just stop, do you? You carry on and you set a new goal. So you're never going to have achieved all your goals because you'll always keep setting new ones. So just enjoy the process um, and have a long-term mindset. Stop having a short-term mindset. No one likes that. That's not a fun mindset to have. Um, so 12 is letting my agility performance define me. I stopped doing that because it just was very unhealthy for me. Um, you know, it's quite a toxic mindset to have. So I let agility identify who I am as a person. Um, and it's, you know, you need to be quite self-aware to realise you're doing this. Um, but I noticed I would feel down about myself after every less than perfect run because for me, my identity is an agility handler. So I'm like, I am Summer, I am an agility handler. And that was that was it. Um, which just wasn't a good idea because then if I have a bad day at a show, I'm, I'm lost. I'm like, well, what am I now? Do you get what I mean? Um, I know that's quite deep, but maybe some of you will, will know what I mean. Uh, so I was linking a lot of my self-worth to my agility performance. Um, which, you know, sort of impacted my self-esteem negatively when I had a bad day at a competition, for example. Um, so really, you have to acknowledge your strengths that have nothing to do with agility. So who are you and what are you good at and what are your values outside of agility? Work on focusing on those. Um, and then even when agility goes wrong, you won't, you you know, it, it, it won't be as such of a big deal and it won't impact you as negatively um, mindset-wise because you have those other things that identify you. So... Just don't let your agility performance define you in that way. You know, don't, just don't. It's not a good idea. So, yeah, I, st I stopped letting my agility performance define me. And it's actually brought brought the fun back in agility as well. Um, it stops it getting so serious and obsessive. Um, but that is that. So 13 um, is eating whatever food was available at the show. I stopped eating whatever food was available at the show um, and I know a lot of people still do it and that is fine um, but for me, I stopped doing it and it's helped me so I stopped buying burgers or chips out of pure convenience so at most shows there are things like burger vans etc um, and it's fine to have a burger or chips but you've just got to take into consideration that you probably won't feel your best on you know, sort of greasy food like that won't give you loads of energy. It'll probably make you feel groggy, in fact, so you probably won't run as well as you would otherwise. Um, so my advice is to pack a healthy, nutritious and filling lunch that will give you energy for your runs, um, getting all your nutrients in there so you get your protein, fats, carbs, etc. Um, so I take things like protein bagels with avocado and chicken or ham um, or eggs or something like that to keep me going. Uh, protein bar stuff like that so if you go prepared then you won't have to go and buy um this sort of unhe i say unhealthy sort of i don't want to say unhealthy but like you know it's not it's not it's not the food that you really would think oh i'll put that into my body t so i can run really well do you get what i mean um so i stopped just eating out of convenience it shows and started taking my own food um and it gave me so much more energy in my runs to last me the whole day it made me feel way better so yeah, I stopped doing that, and that also helped my bank account actually. So again, double whammy. Um, I wasn't spending because I was just bringing food, so I wasn't spending food, spending food, spending food on money. I wasn't spending money on food because I'd already brought it. So there you go. If you need more motivation to bring your own food, just think of your bank account. If you don't spend any money, if you have a show every weekend, that's four weekends worth of money on food saved. And you can do something more fun with that money. <laughs> so that is 13. Now 14 uh, goes a little bit la back to uh, number 12 about letting agility define me. But it's letting agility consume my life. So I stopped letting agility consume my life. And if you see my room that I'm staring into right now, you'll probably already know that agility is pretty much my entire life. Um, it is a huge part of my life. It is everything to me. However, 
it also isn't. <laughs> it, it's strange because agility does mean everything to me, but there are also other things in my life that have value and that I enjoy doing that have nothing to do with agility. Um, and I have managed to find um, a, a better balance between all these things. So, yes, I'm still taking agility seriously and concentrating on it and stuff. But there's also lots of other things that I also spend my time doing when I'm not doing agility that I enjoy pretty much just as much, really. Um, so I made the mistake of not having a life outside of agility at one point. Um, and to be honest, doing that, it stops you from having other fulfilling experiences. So if you're only doing one thing with your time, you are potentially missing out on lots of other exciting experiences in life um, that you could be doing if you just became more open to it. Um, you know, so just open yourself up to other things and other experiences that have nothing to do with agility, um, as that's very healthy. So work on your social life and other hobbies. Uh, so I make sure that I still have a social life and it's so much fun. Um, and, you know, you don't have to be sensible all the time when you do agility. You don't have to go to bed early every night. You don't have to not drink alcohol. You don't have to not go for big meals out and stay up late and stuff as long as it's not every day. Um, I do it maybe once a month, if that. Um, I think I had a night out the weekend and my last night out was in October. So that's like October, November, December, January, four months ago. Um, so it's definitely very rare. But as long as it's there and you're having those experiences, I think that really helps your mental state as far as agility goes um, and not letting it consume your entire life. Um, and then have other hobbies. So like for me, uh, the gym, which is ironic because I started the gym to get better at agility. But now the gym, like even if I didn't do agility, I would still go to the gym every single day. I'd probably spend more time in the gym um, if I didn't have agility because it would be my main hobby. But yeah, fitness is a huge hobby of mine. Um, and other things like writing, uh, taking photos, anything that's not got to, you know, that's not agility, just have those other hobbies and work on them um, and save time for them as well. Um, it really prevents an unhealthy obsession with agility. Um, it also keeps it fun. Again, it, it just stops that obsession um, and it, it keeps it feeling more like a hobby than a chore or a job or whatever. Um, if, if, you're, if you just do one thing and one thing only in your life, you're not going to enjoy it forever. It's going to get too much. You'll probably burn out. Um, and it also means you aren't lost without it if you have to take a break. So, for example, sometimes we're forced to take a break. Maybe we get injured. Maybe our dog gets injured. Maybe we get ill. Maybe our dog gets ill. What do you like when I uh, when Arrow did his wrist in? He sprained his wrist um, ages ago, um, and I had to have ages off agility. Um, I did keep doing bits with Ethel to be fair, but you know now Arrow is my only competing dog. If he gets injured and I can't do agility, I don't want my life to just collapse. So I still have things that I would do and occupy my time with if I couldn't do agility for whatever reason. You know if. Um, if there's a huge recession and shows can't go on, you know, I know I'm being dramatic here, but you never know what's going to happen. So it's nice to keep um, your options open and not put all your eggs in one basket. Um, so that's a big one for me. Uh, I stopped letting agility consume my entire life, even though it is still my main focus and priority in life. Um, I also do lots of other things um, that I enjoy. Um, and yeah, that is a big one. And then 15. So the last point um, I've got for you today is I stopped deleting videos of runs that went badly without analysing them. Now, I admit, um, I did have a point of... Um, so, I always get my runs videoed, um, and then I obviously post them, but, you know, there's more to just filming your runs than just to post them online afterwards. Um, you should be thinking about getting your runs videoed so that you can look back on them and analyse them. Uh, you know, see where it went well, which is obvious why we all look at our runs and be like, oh, we did that really well. But also analyse them when they go badly. Um, so don't immediately try to forget it ever happened as awful as the run may have gone and as much of a car crash as it was in your head. Often you'll watch it back and think that wasn't actually as bad as it felt. I remember I had a run um, over winter and it felt like a catastrophe to me. I just wanted to get out of that damn ring. It was horrible. I wanted to delete the video immediately and never, ever ever even remember that happened. I wanted to forget that even happened. <laughs> um, and I didn't want to relive it through watching the video, but I did. I made myself. Um, I watched it, analysed it, acknowledged what went wrong, and I owned up to the mistakes I made as a handler, which, you know, we all make them. It's fine. And then I learnt from it. I was like, I'd do this differently next time. Or, oh, this is why Arrow did that. And often we feel better after doing that because we understand. So, you know, maybe we didn't see a trap or something when we were actually on the course, but we watched the video back a few times and we're like, oh, that's why I did it, bless him. No wonder it was right. There was, there was a tunnel entrance right there or, you know, oh, no wonder he sent into that tunnel. My hand was actually out, even though I didn't mean for it to be. So next time I'll keep my hand back or in or, 
you know, I'll turn my shoulders or something. So don't delete your videos. I stopped deleting my videos of runs that went badly. Um, and it's actually up to my agility game because I can now learn from my mistakes um, more easily because I can firsthand see the mistakes happening when I watch it back. Um, and you just remember, don't you, after you make a mistake, you just remember um, and you don't do it again. So yeah, they, those are my 15 points for today. Um, hope you enjoyed that. Again, I still do the, these things automatically sometimes and have to snap myself out of it and go, no, you're not doing that anymore. Um, but honestly, they, they, those things have helped me so much, um, breaking those uh, sort of bad habits that didn't serve me. And yeah, so I hope you enjoyed today's um, episode. Give it a share if you think, if you know anyone who would um, enjoy it or benefit from hearing them. And yeah, so I will see you all at Crufts, hopefully, or most of you, um, over the next few days. Super exciting. So I'm competing Thursday, Sunday. So come and say hi if I'm there again. Um, also, don't forget to follow me on all of the socials. I'm active on those every single day. Um, I'll be active on them over Crufts as well, so you can keep up with how that's going for me this week. Um, I'll put those here on the YouTube video and down below on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Uh, so follow me on all those and if you could leave the podcast a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts that would be amazing thank you so much guys um, and subscribe on the YouTube channel as well as giving the podcast a follow on all the platforms um, Spotify and Apple Podcasts so you don't miss a future episode and yeah I will see you at Crufts and then I will speak to you all like this again next Wednesday at 8pm and I will give you all a Crufts recap at the start of that episode so whatever um, topic I do that episode on I will make sure to give you a Crufts recap um, and look out for my YouTube video I'll be vlogging Crufts that should be up um, hopefully the week after Crufts or maybe the week after but yeah subscribe so you don't miss anything that I'm doing or anything that's going on and I will speak to you guys later thanks for watching guys bye